Good evening, everyone that's here. Uh, we really appreciate you coming out. We know you're leaving your homes and obligations, and we know tomorrow's work. But we also know we have patriot people there. And uh, before I begin our memorial, there's two things I wanted to say. This event is ran by the county. This is not a political event. There are Democrats amongst us, there are Republicans, and there's people of other beliefs here. So we don't fringe on anyone, especially on tax paying money. We don't do that. So I had to make sure that that was understood. We have three special guests here, and eventually you will meet them. But I'd like to highlight a local business that made this special event happen. And the special business of local, uh, local uh, community, I'd like to introduce Ben Fetter from got to remember now, we always do it outside. We don't do it inside, so it's not always perfect. <laughs> this is not an advertisement. That's why we're doing it right up front. It's amazing. Ben, please step up. Come on, step up. Step up. No, come up here. Ben and I go back a long time, and he has a partner named Joni Lino, and Joni and I grew up together as kids. And I told them what I did and what, I, what I'm doing, and they were like, hey, we got to take this and run with this. We got to show our love to these people. And they came up, and Big Apple came up and did that. And uh, also, too, when the event's over, you go to any Big Apple store and just say 9-11, just for tonight, and you'll get a free slice and a soda. <laughs> just for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. God bless you. So I needed to get that out of the way before we did our memorial, because that, I don't want to put promoting of anything into it, but it played a big role on what we're doing tonight. So I'd like to thank you all. Ed Campy is on a business trip. He couldn't make it, but he's second. Don't say I said anything. We have our original, uh, what do they call that, MCs. Uh, one of the greatest guys, he's got a good voice. He's got like that outstanding John Wayne's voice for those old guys like me. Uh, Jim Sack. Let's get a big round of applause for Jim. Uh, John Wayne, I'm in good company, I guess, tonight. Thank you very much, Dennis McKenna, and uh, I appreciate uh, being back here to MC this memorial for 9-11. It's been uh, about three years since I was here, so I am very, very pleased to be back with all of you this evening. And thank you for being here on this 23rd anniversary of the darkest day in the history of this country. But more than that, we're here tonight to pay tribute to those who died that day and the first responders who put their lives on the line that day. Let us begin our tribute this evening with the presentation of the colors by the Martin County Fire Rescue Honor Guard, if you would please stand.
Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and the America's Creed, led by the Daughters of the American Revolution, Halpati Oti Chapter. I'm never going to be able to say that right. Sorry. Thank you. Please remain standing for our national anthem and God Bless America, which will be performed by Daryl McGill and with sign language interpreter Lisa E. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'm going to sing God Bless America and everyone please join in. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Our invocation this evening is going to be provided by Sean Lissowy, Fire Bureau Chief from the Martin County Fire Rescue Department. Thank you, sir. Let's, uh, let's take a seat. Give those uh, legs a rest. Well, today we come together to remember and honor the lives lost on September 11, 2001. As we honor the courageous individuals who selflessly gave their lives during that tragic event were reminded of the profound words spoken by Jesus in John 15, 13. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. This verse serves as a powerful reminder that the highest form of love is demonstrated when someone is willing to sacrifice their own life for the sake of others. 
In light of their sacrifice, let's honor their memory by practicing this selfless love in our own lives. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we gather here today to remember and reflect upon the events of that fateful day. We come before you with humble hearts, lifting up our prayers and thoughts to the grieving families and friends who still carry the weight of loss in their hearts. We ask for your comforting presence to surround them, providing solace and strength in their moment of sorrow. And may your loving grace remind them that they're not alone. Lord, we're grateful for this memorial ceremony each year as it serves as a reminder of the sacrifices made. May this evening be blessed, and may our words and actions bring honor to you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're going to have a little musical interlude provided by the Opus Choir from Martin County High School. Good evening, everyone. My name is Colin Moore, and I'm a part of the Martin County High School Choir Opus. Tonight, I think I speak for all of my peers when I say that we are honored to sing for America tonight. Tonight, we are remembering America's unsung heroes, those who bear the uniform of courage and answer to the sound of freedom's call. We invite you to sing with us towards the end of the song because we will be singing My Country Tis of Thee, my apologies. <clears throat> so without further ado, please enjoy our performance and God bless America, thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for the Opus Choir from Martin County High School. Thank you very much for participating in this memorial service this evening. We do appreciate it. That's going to be pretty hard to follow. So, <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Hayes. I'm a division chief of Martin County Fire Rescue. I'd like to take a moment to just say thank you to all of our first responders, military service personnel that are here tonight. And thank you all of you for coming here as we honor those who lost their lives due to the events that occurred on September 11th, 2001. I want to start off by asking you all, how many of you remember where you were when you first heard the news? For those of you born before 2001. <laughs> so I remember where I was. <clears throat> I was 11 years old. I was in sixth grade. So it seems kind of young, right? My teacher came in after being pulled out on the hallway and, and tried coming in. Uh, she, was, she looked frightened, emotional, trying to explain to a group of sixth graders what a terrorist attack even is. And for, for me at the time, I couldn't understand why somebody would want to do that to somebody else, much less that large of a group of people, for no reason. So it wasn't until years later that I joined the fire service that I really understood the significance of that impact. So today I want to share a few thoughts from the perspective of somebody who is currently in the fire service. And when I thought about what to speak on, two words came to mind. One was significance and two was remembrance. So first talking about significance. Today marks the 23rd anniversary of an attack that, that shook our country and changed it forever. Almost 3,000 people died that day, including 343 firefighters. That event deeply impacted the field of emergency services, especially for fire rescue. The first responders, the firefighters, law enforcement officers, and paramedics, they rushed to those towers, the Pentagon and the crash site, knowing the danger that lied ahead, but they still proceeded putting others first. <clears throat> These men and women embodied who we are, the best of who we are, as a nation. And in those dark hours, they reminded us that even in the face of unspeakable evil, goodness can still prevail. Since then, the fire service has forever changed. The weight of our responsibilities have grown, as well as the public's <clears throat> trust in us. We have faced new challenges and our roles have evolved, but one thing has stayed the same, and that's our commitment to the community and putting others first. When I think of that day, there's two images that come to mind that I'm sure you all have seen. And the, the, the first is the image of the firefighters raising the flag at ground zero. And the second is on the side of the Pentagon, there was a flag that was unfurled on the side of it during search and rescue operation. And to me, these, these images are not just pictures. They're symbols of promise to stand strong, serve with honor, and never give up, no matter the challenge. So something shifted in the fire service that day. The world saw, maybe for the first time, just how deep the commitment of a firefighter was to their community. It wasn't about ego or recognition. It was about putting others first. It was about carrying on a tradition of bravery and dedication that's been passed down through generations. So now I want to focus on the other word, remembrance. No matter how many years go by, we must never forget the people who were forever defined by the events that occurred that day. In 2001, 442 firefighters were honored, with 343 of them from the World Trade Centers alone. We see that number often. I see it on fire trucks. I see it on bumper stickers, t-shirts. But we must not forget that these people are not just numbers. They were fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, family, friends. They were just like you and I. And they shared a commitment to serve. <clears throat> and they reminded us that our job is unlike any other. So today, I want us to remember that these symbols we wear, like these badges and these patches, they're not just for decoration. They're promises to those we serve, to the ones we lost, 
and to ourselves. To keep going, keep serving, and never forget why we do this. So as I close, I encourage each of you to reflect. When you pass by places like this library and fire stations within the community, I'm, I'm sure you saw it as you, as you pulled in. But there's, <clears throat> there's remnants of the 9-11 tragedy outside that are set up as memorials. Don't look at them as just pieces of metal. These are symbols honoring those who lost their lives. And while these memorials may rust and weather with time, let's ensure that the memories they represent live within us and we continue to pass them on for future generations. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now please welcome Major Peter Croft. Major Croft is the Director of Law Enforcement for the Martin County Sheriff's Office. It's got to be close from what I'm told. All right. Before I, uh, before I share my thoughts with you this evening, I do want to take a moment and just, just recognize what a great event this is to have you know, everybody from the community here. We have kids that were clearly not born before 2001. And uh, I, much like Chief Hayes, uh, I was in school um, when this happened. I remember my teacher coming in and uh, turn on the TV and we happened to catch that second plane hit. And uh, watching a, a group of also middle schoolers hit that and just, just remembering that moment, I think it probably set us on a path that we never really got off the track of. So with that, I will like to just say a few words I wrote down just to remember the evening and, and uh, you know, dignify the event. So as, as a deputy of the Martin County Sheriff's Office, standing before you today is an honor, but it is also a heavy responsibility. We gather here to remember a day that changed our country forever. September 11, 2001, on that morning, nearly 3,000 innocent lives were taken from us. Numerous first responders who made the ultimate sacrifice, rushing toward danger when others fled. For those of us who are first responders, that day holds a special significance. We saw our brothers and sisters in uniform face the absolute worst case scenario. And we witnessed the strength of their courage, their duty, and their unwavering commitment to protect and serve no matter the cost. I think about the first responders who ran into the Twin Towers, not knowing what they'd face, but driven by the same sense of duty that calls us all in law enforcement. We all take an oath to protect our communities, to defend those in need, and on that day, that oath was tested in the most historic way. Many did not make it home, but their bravery and their sacrifice will never be forgotten. It is our responsibility to carry their memory forward, to honor them by living up to the values they embodied. As a deputy, I strive to remember that our duty to protect doesn't just apply in moments of great crisis. It applies every day. In every call we respond to and in every interaction we have, we strive to uphold the safety and security of those who are, we are sworn to protect. However, beyond the badge and uniform, we are also mothers and fathers. We're sons and daughters, neighbors, friends, September 11th reminds us that life is fragile and precious. We saw the worst of humanity that day, but we also saw the best. The way we came together stood shoulder to shoulder and united in our grief, our resilience, and our strength. Today we honor not just the fallen officers and first responders, but also every single soul who was lost that day. We remember the families who still grieve the survivors who still carry the scars, and the spirit of unity that emerged from the ashes. As a member of this community and as a deputy, I carry the lessons of that day with me in everything I do. I am reminded of the responsibility we all share to look out for one another, to serve with integrity, and to never take a single moment for granted. In the memory of those we lost, we carry on. 
We remember the sacrifice, we honor their courage, and we remain steadfast in our commitment to protecting and serving, no matter the challenge and no matter the cost. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Appreciate it. Now please welcome the tax collector for Martin County. Of course you can. Ruth Petrashevsky. Ruth. Good evening. Um, and thank you, especially to Dennis McKenna for giving me this honor for speaking tonight. <laughs> thank you. We stand here tonight, 23 years later, with visions of aircraft crashing into the World Trade Center, vivid images of bodies falling to their death from the Twin Towers, and memories of the missing persons posters plastered all over Manhattan. Our flag still stands for freedom, and I, for one, will never forget those men and women who died and gave that right to us. I am proud to be an American. Every one of us remembers where we were, who we were with, and what we were doing the morning of September 11, 2001. It started out as a beautiful day with a crystal clear sky that made the skyscrapers in New York City sparkle, soon to become a hot and fiery war zone. Four commercial airliners took off, fully boarded with innocent men, women, and children, none of whom would survive. The first plane crashed into Tower 1 of the World Trade Center, and just 18 minutes later, a second plane crashed into Tower 2. The crystal clear skies were now filled with smoke. Fire spread and it was so dark you could barely see. Screams and cries pierced through the heavy smoke and darkness. When the third plane hit the Pentagon, most of us had no idea of what to do or where to turn. We just knew that America was under attack and the world watched as the unspeakable horrors unrolled. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation and tear our country apart, but it didn't. Instead, it united us. America stood tall and stood strong. It's not in our first responders' DNA to run the other way. The foundations of our largest steel building shook, all three buildings toppled, but it couldn't bring down the brave men and women made of steel that had made it their life's job to protect us. As thousands of people scrambled to get out of the World Trade Center, hundreds of firefighters, law enforcement, military personnel, and even coworkers scrambled to get in and headed right into the raging inferno, charging up those stairs, leading survivors down the steps, and carrying the injured on their shoulders. Then went right back up all those flights and back down again over and over until the towers fell. Injured were buried in the wreckage. Bodies were incinerated and crushed as the buildings fell down around them. Our first responders continued saving victims, sacrificing their own lives for others who didn't even know their names. The fourth plane never made it to its targeted destination because the passengers stormed the terrace in the cockpit and all plunged to their death, crashing in a field in Pennsylvania. How many lives did these heroes save by courageously sacrificing themselves? Afterwards, President Bush passed the Real ID Act, created TSA, and put safeguards in place to prevent any future terrorist activities. The world saw America stand tall that day saw America stand together, and saw Americans say no to terrorism. It, saddened me, it saddens me that terrorists can easily come into our country now and put everyone at risk. Did many of us not learn a lesson, or did some of us just forget? Please, God, bless America, this land that we love, still the land of the free because of the brave. This nation needs to stand up for America and still defend her today, united and unafraid, because we are Americans, and nothing can change who we are. God bless this USA, and God bless all of you true patriots for coming out tonight and remembering our heroes. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Appreciate it. Now from local 40 iron workers and the first responder to the World Trade Center, please welcome to the stage John Finnamore. Good evening. Uh, I'm a fourth generation union iron worker from New York. And uh, I know I don't need this thing. I'm from New York. I talk a lot. 
But uh, I believe this is my fifth year. Dennis McKenna had invited me to speak as a first responder. And uh, I'll share briefly about 9-11. And uh, I take this personal because uh, my family erected the two towers in the 70s, 71, 72. My grandfather was the local 40 union president who hired American Indians and brothers to erect those steel towers. I would look out my kitchen window and watch my dad come home and I would watch those towers go up and up. Now you see that picture of that cross? While we were on the pile, we held mass every day next to that cross. Father Peter would do a mass and bless us all. What I've got to say is, I take it personal because we were attacked. The shame, the pain, the hurt goes on till today. My friends were in that tower. I often say their names just to remember them. Captain Vincent Brunton and Fireman Peter Vega, who I got a chance to grow up with in a blue collared neighborhood and they are always in my prayers. Uh, as far as I know, I spent 14 weeks on that pile. It is the worst part of my life, no doubt. For those people that we lost and we pray for, what my shirt says, never forget, I haven't forgotten and I won't forgive. My experience I went back after I spent 14 weeks on that pile and rebuilt the first part of the new towers, which was the train station, the hub. Because as you know, it came from New Jersey underground into, into the uh, circle and that was destroyed. We rebuilt that first. Uh, there's no exception how people got the pride to do it. It all came from heart. We rebuilt, and we remember how we did it. We did it together. I always often say, why did it take a bad tragedy like this to happen, to be self-destructed for the world to come together? I met people from all over the country on that pile. And here's a short story. I was burning some steel and moving it out with a couple of cranes, and uh, I had to go change my settling bottle. I was burning steel. And there was a fireman's jacket on top of my torch. And the name on it said Riches, R-I-C-H-E-S. This is a gentleman that I haven't seen in 10 years and I grew up with. He's a fireman. And I ran into him and I says, Jimmy, what's going on? He says, my son is underneath the six building. We both cried, we both prayed. And every anniversary I spoke in New York, I would run into him. And he's always in my heart. They never recovered any of his son. What I ask you to do is, even though you don't know these people, you really do. They're part of our lives. They're generations. We have new generations. And what really ticks me off is some of the schools today don't want to put American history in their books. And that disgusts me. Because I grew up learning about American history. And the younger youth should. That's just my opinion. Now what I'd like to say is, today, thank you Dennis McKenna for having me come here for five years. Only my story affects me because the mental health issue of my life is affected. If you're affected with mental health, please do something because for a long time, I isolated myself and I self-destructed because I was afraid. Mental health is one of my biggest issues. I also have a few cancer issues. I got sick, very sick in 2006 from the pile. I am blessed to be here. Every day I get phone calls and I read texts of brothers all over the city just passing away from 9-11 sicknesses. So if you have it in your heart tonight, say a prayer for those people that went into those towers 
Say a prayer for those people that were in those towers, as well as the Pentagon, as well as Shanksville. You see, the worst thing that I discovered was at 5.07 on that night, I was standing two blocks from where seven World Trade Center collapsed. And they asked me, Johnny, no plane hit that. Why did it fall? All of us know that there's conspiracy theories. I don't believe in any of it. It's your beliefs what you want to believe in. I was there. I don't believe what the media says. I don't believe the newspapers. It's all BS. I say it every year. I lived it. I was there. So if you have someone in your heart today that's not here or you lost, whether it's 9-11 or not, we're all one loved and love each other. Thank you. Thank you, John. And now please welcome retired ICE agent, Department of Homeland Security, and the coordinator of this evening's memorial on this 23rd anniversary. Please welcome Dennis McKenna. Thank you, Jim. After a while, after so many years, you become numb when you hear all these things. Because you live through it when you're a first responder. But there's one thing that I have, uh, that I got out of 9-11. And you see, it was September 14, 2001, when, like everybody else that said, they found out their friends and child friends had passed away. And for me, it was enough. I couldn't take it no more. And so I walked down Vesey Street, and there was a lady there with a shopping cart giving out water. And I asked her for two bottles. Normally you don't do that. You only ask for one. But there's so many guys. But I had so much soot in my mouth and my face, I just needed to wash myself after. Enough was enough. So I got two bottles, and I walked down the street. And I found a nice quiet place, and I squashed a bottle in my face, and I just threw my back against the wall. And I started to cry. And I looked up and I said, God, why? And out of nowhere came a gentleman with a black jacket and a white helmet. And he slid down in the rubble alongside me in the dust and put his arm around me. And he said, son, I think you need me now. And it was the first time that someone called me son in over 25 years since my father died when I was 18. So he says to me, my name is Ron Nish. I'm from the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. We are dispatched here to help you guys. So Ron and I talked, and we had a nice conversation. And he was so compelled in what I told him. He gave me his Bible. And his Bible is not just a regular Bible. It's a chaplain Bible. And it has the cross on it and the Star of David. And it has insignias, IC, International Chaplains Association. And he gave me the Bible and said, I want you to use this Bible as health and strength for you to move along in life. And to always remember that God is there with you. And I took the Bible, and I hold on to the Bible for the longest time. And then one day I put on the TV and I seen... A, a horrifying thing I seen. Aurora, Colorado. Innocent people. And I wanted to be there in the worst way. When you're a first responder and you got that taste and you respond and then you start getting unable to respond, you feel less of yourself, like you want to be there. So I decided to make a phone call to the municipality of Aurora, Colorado. And who do I get? But here, Heather Dearman, who is Ashley Moses' cousin. Ashley went into the theater with a 12-year-old daughter and pregnant and came out with no kids, paralyzed. And uh, Heather was her cousin. Now, what's the odds of me calling a municipality and her answering? So it was the first time I ever parted with the Bible. And I made her the custodian. And it's almost like a joke. 
change. We managed to get a rabbi, a Catholic priest, <laughs> yeah, exactly, a Methodist. Uh, we put them all together. And it was amazing what this Bible did. And when it came back, it was like so, it made me feel like a first responder feels. You ask any one of these gentlemen, whether they were in 9-11 or not, they'll tell you, if they could jump out of the car and pull you out of a river that you're in the car, or they could jump out and help you, God forbid, with your baby choking, there's a rewarding feeling after that. And that's what, that's what makes first responders. So I knew that this Bible had something. So from there, it went on. And it went on and on and on. So today, we have a special guest. And the special guest that we have today, everybody knows what happened with a, uh, a Riley in Pennsylvania and how unfortunately a uh, very sick individual fired a shot. And that shot not only wound our President Trump, but also fatally killed someone. And today, his wife and his two children. And that Bible went to them. Now today, Ms. Corey, uh, Ms. Helen Capitori is here to bring the Bible back to me. Ms. Corey. And we have our two children, Ashley, what? Allison, sorry, and uh, Kaylin. I'm, I'm choked up right now. And, and it was so beautiful. And this is why I introduced the, uh, the, the local business. Uh, uh, and this is why I said about them, of course, they were able to bring them in, and we showed them a good time. And these two little, uh, I, I, they're, they're great. They're, they're absolutely great. We caught I, over 30 fish yesterday. We went deep sea fishing, and these two little peanuts, boy, they were banging them in like crazy. And uh, they're beautiful people. And this is what the Bible does. And so it's proof that the Bible does work. And now I'd like to show you a little video of where the Bible's been. Would you like to say so? I just want to say that um, this trip has um, definitely healed our hearts. And that Bible, well, it was because of that. So I just want to thank you. For it's our honor to have you here. And as one community, right? As one community, we stand together and show it her and her daughters. They're not alone, right? Are they alone? No. Are they alone? No. No way you're alone. You got a family behind you. Just remember Martin County. <laughs> Well, a Bible that was traveled many miles is now safely back here in South Florida. It's known as the 9-11 First Responder Bible. These metal columns from the wreckage of the World Trade Center are a reminder of the September 11th tragedy. One first responder who now lives in our area was there and saw the devastation firsthand. This is really a uh, blessing and it it's really works fantastic. Dennis McKenna went to the Jupiter Post Office to get a very important package that contains a one-of-a-kind item that belongs to him a prized possession that he sent all over the nation. It's amazing how the response I get from this Bible 
when it goes to a place of catastrophe and people in stress. McKenna is a retired first responder who spent more than two weeks at the wreckage of the World Trade Center searching for survivors in 2001. While he was at Ground Zero, a police chaplain from California who was in New York at the scene of the terrorist attack gave him a small Bible. He gave me his chaplain's Bible uh, to use it for strength and for the healing process. Now, two decades later, McKenna still has that Bible, and he sends it to places around the U.S. shortly after a tragedy such as a mass shooting. The Bible uh, was a strength for me at the World Trade Center. And it did actually help me and give me faith. He says the Bible can bring a sense of peace to people who are suffering. It's not meant to change anyone's beliefs or anyone's feelings, but it's meant to help people heal and move on in life. The Bible has just been returned to him after he sent it to Boulder, Colorado, the scene of a mass shooting that claimed 10 lives at a supermarket in March. The Bible was used at a memorial service in Boulder. Over the years, McKenna has also sent the 9-11 First Responder Bible to places where other mass shootings happened, such as Aurora, Colorado, Newtown, Connecticut, scene of the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary, and Las Vegas, where dozens died in a shooting spree in 2017. I hope it heals them and makes them move on in life and be able to uh, have some sort of uh, sense of, of uh, a sense of you're not alone. There are other people with you. The 9-11 First Responder Bible also has a diary that goes with it in which people can write brief messages. The Bible was blessed by the Pope in Madison Square Garden in 2015. Now I'm retired. I don't respond anymore to help. So my Bible goes out and responds for me and does the job that uh, I would be doing in trying to help people. Where will the 9-11 Bible be going next? McKenna says wherever people are hurting who need it the most. Dennis McKenna came here to the Alton community not knowing what Ryan's family were going to say, how they'd react, but he says they lit up seconds after meeting him. Here I am into being into privacy, where it's, I know it's time for privacy. And I knocked on the door just as confidence because I've seen the Bible work before. Minutes after police identified the person arrested and charged in the death of 14-year-old Ryan Rogers, Jupiter resident Dennis McKenna knocked on his family's door, holding this special Bible that has traveled across the country for over two decades. They treated me as if I was like a friend that I knew them for years. That's how beautiful these people are. They were amazing. They're such great, nice people, and it's such a shame. It's a shame for it to happen to anyone. McKenna handed this one-of-a-kind gift from a chaplain after working in the rubble following the 9-11 attacks. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis McKenna. Dennis, thank you, and thank you also to our other guest speakers for sharing your thoughts about that day 23 years ago. We now have a wreath saying, wreath uh, laying ceremony with the help of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Hal Patiochi chapter. Did I get it? And, and the Coast Guard, excuse me. Thank you for this opportunity. I am Kathy McCartney, Regent of Hal Patioke Chapter, National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution, located in Stewart. Hal Patioke Chapter honors Corey Compatori as a hero who instinctively protected his family by sacrificing his own life. Today, we present this certificate recognizing his service, his courage, his leadership, and his patriotism to his wife, Mrs. Helen Campatori, and his two daughters, 
Allison, and Kaylee. We have heard the tragic details of his sacrifice. Corey Campatore served as a veteran of the U.S. Army Reserves and a firefighter, fire chief, a first responder. Although his tragic death was not, was not a result of 9-11, he was at his core a first responder, which is defined as a person who is among those responsible for responding to an emergency to provide assistance. As a family man, loving husband, and father, we acknowledge his instinct as a first responder, his service, and his courage, whether on duty or retired, to protect those around him, paying the ultimate sacrifice. On behalf of the Hal Patioke chapter, NSDAR, and its approximate 300 members, we offer our thoughts and prayers to you for your loss. At this time, we ask that your family accept this recognition of, of distinguished citizen service on behalf of Corey Campatori. So I'm going to name only 20 firefighters from 9-11 that passed away, not 343. When I call the name, just bring up a rose and place it by the uh, wreath. And these guys are closest to my heart. I knew a lot of them. Chief of Department, Peter Gancy. Jimmy. Uh, Epi. Epi, come to me. Oh, you can't get up. Okay. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> I love picking on them. Assistant Chief Donald Burns. <phone rings> Deputy Chief Ray Downing. <phone rings> Deputy Chief Larry Stack. Deputy Chief, Dennis Cross. <phone rings> Battalion Chief, Oriel Palmer. <phone rings> Made it to the 72nd floor and said we could put this fire out and then the buildings collapsed. Captain, Patty Brown. Captain Thomas Farino, who I drove Tommy 90% of the time and 10% is why I'm here tonight. Firefighter Timmy Stackpole. <laughs> Lieutenant Robert Regan. Lieutenant Kenny Fallon. <phone rings> Firefighter Mike Fiore.
fighter fighter, Robert Spears, who was only a probie. Lieutenant Billy McGinn. Firefighter Billy Henry. Fighter Fighter John Heffernan. Fighter Fighter Ruben Carrera. Firefighter Larry Figueroa. And last but not least, Firefighter Paul Tagmeyer. Another probing. Oh, I'm sorry, I got another guy. Firefighter Dana Hannon. Fire to fire. I think that's the last one. Oh, that's for the three, 343 remaining. You, you know my act. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. And keeping in mind those who we remember with those roses and all who died on that day so long ago, I invite Pastor John Bartz of New Beginnings Church to provide us a spiritual message. Good evening. Thank you for this privilege of being a part of this 9-11 Remembrance Service uh, this evening. My name is Pastor John Bartz, and as you've already heard earlier, we all remember where we were and what we were doing 23 years ago on this day. And it's ironic because probably uh, none of us can probably remember what we were doing one week ago or where we even were one week ago tonight, and yet we all remember very vividly where we were and what we were doing when we received the news of 9-11. We remember because as you've heard tonight, nearly 3,000 Americans lost their lives. Another 6,000 were wounded. And since that day, there have been over 4,300 deaths related to 9-11 sicknesses and thousands of others who are uh, bearing the, uh, the scars and the sickness related to 9-11. And so tonight we gather to remember, to pray, and to seek God's comfort. In the midst of our memories of this tragic evening, we are also reminded that we serve and that we have a God of great love and compassion, a God who cares deeply for the hurting, a God who does more than just observe our suffering but enters into our suffering. When Jesus was preparing to leave his disciples and his disciples wondered how they would continue on without him, he told them that our Heavenly Father was sending an advocate, a comforter, known as the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate who will never leave you. John 14, verse 26, he says, But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. And then a few verses later, John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus said, But I will send you the advocate, the Spirit of truth, and he will come to you from the Father. Essentially, Jesus was saying, I am no longer going to be with you. But I promise you this, you will never be alone. Because I am sending an advocate, a comforter, 
the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will never leave you. He will go with you wherever you are, and he will be of great comfort to you. That's how this 9-11 responding uh, Bible, also known as the Traveling Bible, got started, as you heard Dennis share. Because the San Bernardino chaplain gave Dennis this Bible at the site of the World Trade Centers in New York. And I was told that every time a body was retrieved from the rubble, another family would not have a family member that would come home that evening. But in that moment, the Bible was read, a prayer was cited, and they petitioned the great advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to go in their absence and to be a present and be a presence with that family. As you saw in the video and as you heard, since 9-11, this Bible has traveled all around the country, providing comfort in times of great loss and tragedy, reminding families around our country that our Heavenly Father has sent the Holy Spirit to be of comfort and to be an advocate for us in our time of need. The Apostle Paul spoke of the source of this great comfort, saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give the same comfort that God has given us. For the more that we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and your salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. And then you can patiently endure the same things that we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. Paul said, we are confident that as we share in suffering, we will share in the comfort that God gives to us. The comfort of God enters every heart, every home, every community in the greatest time of need and trouble. Much the same way that this responding and traveling Bible has been of great comfort to countless families and first responders since 9-11. But most recently, as you heard, this Bible was sent to Helen and to her daughters and her family, Allison and Kaylee to be of comfort to them in the tragedy of when they lost Corey, a beloved husband and father, who was tragically killed at the Trump rally in Butler, Pennsylvania on July 13th. Corey, as you heard, was a man who loved God and who loved his family and loved his country, a man who was a first responder, but also who gave his life that very day protecting his family. And so tonight we are honored to have the Comparator family as our guests here in Palm City and Martin County at this remembrance service. And we pray the comfort of God's Holy Spirit to be upon you. This Bible has been sent to thousands of people throughout the United States over the last 23 years where loss or tragedy has struck in communities. And tonight, as you saw, Helen has returned this Bible on this very sacred night that we remember the events of 9-11, so that this Bible can be passed on to be of comfort to someone else in their time of need. Our loving Heavenly Father has given us also a traveling advocate who never leaves us, who is with us in every trial, every tragedy and every triumph, advocating for us and comforting us, so that even when we are weighed down by troubles, we can be confident that just as we share in our sufferings, we can also share in the comfort that God gives to us. So that when we are comforted, we in turn can comfort one another. And so tonight, we pray that the Holy Spirit may comfort and continue to comfort all those who lost loved ones at 9-11. We pray that the Holy Spirit will comfort those who have experienced great tragedies since that, night of, that day of 9-11. We think of even the most recent tragedy in Widener, Georgia. And we pray for Helen and Allison and Kaylee. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite my wife, Dr. Kathy McKinnon, to come 
And she is going to be offering a prayer of blessing over Helen and, a and Allison and Haley. And also to be a, uh, offer a prayer of blessing for our nation and those that we remember this evening. So that as we share together in the sufferings of one another, we can also share in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And so, Kathy, will you come? My name is Dr. Kathy McKinnon, and I have been a nurse for 32 years. The early part of my nursing career was pediatric and adult trauma. And then I became a hospital chaplain and now a professor at a university. So it is my honor and privilege to be able to pray for each and every one of us. And thank you so much, Dennis, for using God's word to send it around the world to bless so many. We thank you so much for this opportunity, and thank you for everything. love for everybody to please stand and just if you would reach your hands to Helen, Allison, and Kaylee as you bow your heads and gather in prayer. Father God, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus and we thank you. We thank you for this amazing evening that you have given us to show you all the honor and glory that you are due. God, we pray right now for Helen, Allison, and Kaylee. God, we ask that your hedge of protection would be upon them, that the power of the Holy Spirit would fall upon them, that your hands would comfort them, that the Holy Spirit would guide their future, direct their path, and give them comfort like only you can. God, we pray that your guardian angels would stand guard and bless them in, in numerous and miraculous ways. God, we pray where they are weak and when they are grieving, that you would give them peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, we pray in agreement right now that what the enemy has meant for harm, that good would come through tragedy, that love and peace would saturate their hearts, and that joy would fill them, that the memories of a father and a husband would always be close to their heart and that they could feel Corey's love every day for the rest of their life. Father, we pray over the nation. We ask you now, God, to come down and to bring justice and righteousness and goodness and love to our country. God, we pray for the police officers, the firefighters, the first responders. We ask your hand to be upon them and for your power to strengthen them and for your grace to pour upon them and to give them the wisdom, the knowledge, the discernment that they need to do the work that you have called them to do. God, we pray for those that have lost loved ones in this tragedy of 9-11. We remember them, God. They are in the forefront of our mind. We pray a blessing over the families that are here still with us, that are battling sickness and disease because of that tragedy. God, we pray for healing to come across our country. God, we pray for unity amongst our nation. And we ask that you could use us to rise up, to, to always proclaim your name, to bow down to you first, to put you first, to humble ourselves, and to call upon the name, the name of Jesus, to heal us and to help us. God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for those that are serving in our military. And we ask you now to just pour your favor upon us, this country, and upon our families. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We just have a couple of more items to go before we conclude our memorial service for this year. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Martin County Sheriff's Office to perform taps for us. Come on in. Right there? Okay. We were going to have a three rifle volley, but <laughs> the, roof, the roof is in the way. So we will just have taps.
Please stand. And we are now going to conclude this 9-11 Memorial Tribute with Amazing Grace from the Space Coast Highlanders. <laughs> 